This is June 15th, uh, 2018. We are in Bedford, Massachusetts at the Edith Norse Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Jim Ramsey. Uh, our camera person is Maureen Sullivan. And we are very privileged to have with us today Richard Diaz. So welcome, R Richard. Thank you. Um, may I ask when you were born? August 31st, 1946, in Winthrop, Massachusetts. Winthrop, Massachusetts. And where do you currently live? At the uh, uh, Community Living Center, which is a fancy name for a uh, nursing home, at uh, Bedford, Massachusetts. The VA? At the VA, yes. Right, good. And uh, are you married? No, I was married, uh, I mean, I, I was married for 42 years, but my wife passed away oh, five years ago. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so was I. I bet you were. And do you have children? <clears throat> I had a total of three. Um, one by a high school uh, girlfriend, and two by my wife, and they all died. Oh, well, the one, my high school sweetheart is still alive, but everybody else died. Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Well, it was, That's some tough. of it was tough to get through. Did uh, you have grandchildren, perchance, or did... Uh, yeah, uh, my son, before he died, uh, adopted two kids, one from Korea, one from China. Hmm. And the daughter that I have in California has two boys. Uh, one is, uh, I think he's like 28, the other one is 22 or 21 or something like that. Great, great. So you grew up, your early years were in... My in Winthrop, in Massachusetts. Well, my, no, I actually started in the North End. Um, <laughs> I was born in Winthrop, but uh, <coughs> that was the, uh, the hospital? preferred hospital for uh, recent immigrants or uh, World War II veterans, I guess. Um, I started in the North End. We moved to uh, East Boston on Paris Street. Now this was really strange because it was just above the Sumner Tunnel. Okay. And it stunk. <laughs> I mean, it was uh. a terrible area <clears throat> and you had to smell the fumes of all the cars going in and out of that tunnel. And it was the only tunnel of, uh, of access at the time. Um, I moved to uh, Lexington Street in East Boston and then in uh, 1951, uh, my father had come back from, uh, uh, he was an electronics technician, or communications technician, and he um, had come back from the Berlin airlift, hmm. and uh, he had some money to spend, so he bought a house in Winthrop, and that's where we stayed. I didn't speak English uh, when I moved to Winthrop. Um, I, uh, in, in the North End and, and East Boston, it was all Italian. So I spoke Spanish at home and Italian in the street. And when I got to Winthrop, there were all kinds of Irish and Greek, and of course they had their own languages, so, but uh, I didn't speak English until after I started school. So your parents were immigrant, were born in no, other country? Or? No, my, my mother was born in uh, uh, Costa Rica. My father was born in uh, the North End um, his parents were, were both uh, Spanish, mm -hmm. and my grandmother did not speak English. My grandfather had died during the war, and, um, you know, Spanish was spoken. That was the language of, uh, actually, my grandmother came over in 1914, I think, and mm. she was dumped in New York, and they sent her to school to be a seamstress in New York, and she learned to speak Italian because she thought that that's what Americans spoke, because everybody there was Italian. <laughs> I see. So she never learned English? Very, very little. Very little. Wow. So it was, it was Spanish at home and Italian up until I was seven. And then I got into school and nobody liked me speaking Spanish. This was now in Winthrop? Were you in Winthrop at that yeah, point? Right. 
Did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I had a total of four of them, uh, two sisters and two brothers. Uh, one was a year younger than me, one was six years younger, the two sisters a year younger, six years younger, my brother younger uh, was ten years younger and twelve years younger. And actually we grew up in separate households, I mean not, not that they got divorced or anything, but the attitudes and <laughs> the environment changed so radically in ten years that they grew up in a house that I wouldn't have recognized. Huh. So they were younger. Yeah, quite a, quite a bit younger. A lot yeah. younger. Oh, I see. I see. My, but, as a matter of fact, my, my younger, my, my brother Robert, he's uh, the 10 years younger. Um, he was enthralled with my father's being a World War II hero, and I guess he was affected by my being a Vietnam hero, and he spent 44 years in the, in the military, both the Army and the Coast Guard, so. Forty-four years. Yeah. Wow. He just retired. He's uh, sixty-one years old, and he's got arthritis throughout his body. Okay, so Massachusetts is uh, your your base. Have you ever lived other than in Massachusetts, other than their yeah, I did military service. Yeah. I, um, of course, when I was 18, uh, 19 years old, I, I took the tour of South Vietnam or Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, when I got back, I, I started working for an airline in, in Boston. And uh, that was after about a year of trying to get a job anyplace. And um, I stayed there until 1980. At that point, I moved out to Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, okay, so, right. I spent 25 years, 24 years there. In Salt Lake? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that in, in a bit. So you, uh, so where and when did you enter the military? Well, I, I, uh, I was a junior in high school, and uh, this was in uh, well, August of 1965, the uh, Turner Gay and the other, uh, the other uh, destroyers. Maddox? The Maddox. Maddox and the Tur Turner Joy? Yeah, they were attacked in the Tonkin Gulf, and at that point I knew that, that we were going to go to war, and, and nobody else believed me. Uh, so I, I started looking around to, to find some place, because I, I knew I was <coughs> going to go to college. There was, uh, I, was a, I was a very poor high school student, and uh, I was in trouble with everybody. I mean, nobody was pleasant <laughs> at, that, at that age. Huh. To, to me, anyway. Uh, but I was looking to get out, and I uh, chose the Navy. And this guy I knew, who was a, a year ahead of me, he had uh, joined the uh, Navy Reserves in Wynn, Massachusetts. And it was a nice little, uh, <coughs> it was kind of like an old warehouse that they divided up into classrooms and stuff. And um, he, he uh, talked me into going, and. I talked to the recruiter a couple of times, and I liked what I heard, so I signed up. And I had to go back home to ask my father permission to, to go in. He had to sign it because I was 17, and uh, he was in a hurry to sign it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Sign, sign away. So I went in, and and I started drilling in uh, uh, January. I signed up in January 28, 1965. And uh, I went to boot camp in uh, April of the same year. And that was in the Great Lakes. Great Lakes yeah. uh, tr uh, Training Center? Right. Uh, then the next year I went to, um, I served on a two week tour of, uh, on the USS Mississinawa, which was a refueling ship, or replenishing, refueling, whatever you want to call it. And, um, we went up and down the Atlantic coast to refueling carriers and cruisers and so forth and so on. Uh, it was, it was uh, pretty eye-opening for me. That was the first time I ever saw dolphins dance in front of a ship. Mm. I mean, they, they did a, every, this happened every time we refueled. They, they, they did a weaving dance in front of, right in front of the bow of the ship. And they were always in tune, always in time. 
Now, this was after you completed your training, or was this part of your? No, this was part, this was a two-week uh, tour of a uh, uh, yearly tour. And um, I mean, I thought I, I thought I'd died and I wanted to have them. I mean, I said, you know, geez, I'm just a kid in high school, and you know, I, I'm seeing this stuff. And but this, I'm sorry, uh, this was after. This was part of Great Lakes, or this was before no, no. Great Lakes? No, no. April of 65, I went to uh, Great Lakes. Okay. And it was um, uh, August of, I guess it was 65 also. 65, yeah, 65 that I did the two weeks in, in uh, the Mississippi. Okay, okay. And, uh, you know, I got back and I found out that uh, my girlfriend was pregnant, so uh, there was a there was a big problem with that. They, um, at the time, abortions were illegal, and uh, everybody wanted an abortion except me. That was out of the question for me, and uh, <coughs> that put a stop to the argument or the discussion because they knew they couldn't trust me at that point. I was not on board with them, so they threatened to put me in jail, and. Uh, in March of was it March of '66? I left uh, high school as a senior. Uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months from graduation, and I went active duty to the Navy. And I went to a uh, Class A school, which was a communications technician. Okay. D are you familiar with communications technicians? Uh, I I know of the rating. I just I I don't know that. But what what is a communication technicians? Well, it uh, <coughs> it involved uh, learning to type in Russian. And I had to listen to air uh, uh, communications in Morse code, learn Morse code, and and I had a Russian typewriter. And you uh, you c wouldn't know this, but. Russian Cyrillic has four extra characters than the English language, and um, we had to learn the Morse code for those. And uh, it was kind of interesting, but the people were really strange. The people in this field? Intelligence people are really odd. Um, I didn't really appreciate them, and <coughs> I wasn't really happy there. But just to go back just for a second, you, when, when you went to, to boot camp or basic, mm -hmm. you, you were still in high school. Right. So you finished the boot camp, kind of came back to high school. Right. And completed that and then basically began your active duty a couple of weeks shy of graduating from high school. Right. Okay. And then, so you went to school to be a communications technician. Right. But... But they found out about my girlfriend, and also I have relatives in Central America and Spain, and they didn't really appreciate that because that was a uh, that was a uh, security risk because I didn't have oh, contact. The with The fact them. that you had relatives in right, right. other countries. Right. I see. Okay. Well, see, the thing the thing is that uh, CTs have uh, top secret clearances. Understand. And um, <coughs> as a matter of fact, while I was in school, some of these people were arrested by a local police department, and they lost their clearances immediately. So <coughs> <coughs> with those people, if you comb your hair wrong, you know, you're out of the program. So I got out of the program and went to uh, the USS Northampton, which is a presidential command cruiser. And what does that mean? It means... It's like Air Force One. It, it, uh, in case of an emergency, the president has a place to command the, the armed forces from sea. So there were two ships involved. It was the USS uh, Northampton, CC-1, and the USS Wright, which was CC-2. CC, CC is, is cruiser? Uh, command cruiser. Command right? cruiser, okay. And um, it was an interesting tour, but it was too spitballish. I mean, everything had to be done exactly right, and it was it was miserable. It was like I was being punished. Oh, were you a? So you were still a communications? No. Or were you? Still? No, no. I was in the fleet. I was Black Shoe Navy by that time. Did you have a uh, 
specialty or? Yeah, well, I designated myself or I asked to be uh, trained as a communication or a uh, fire control technician. And what does a fire control technician do? Well, it's uh, directing uh, uh, live fire from the, uh, the guns via the computer and the human control. In other words, we had a, 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 a what's called a main battery director or a director, and uh, depending on the the, the role pitch and yaw of the ship, you have uh, two different azimuths. We have a vertical and a horizontal in this little box at the top, the very top of the ship, and you're going back and forth and. And I had one which was vertical, and as soon as my vertical crossed the target or was on target, I'd pull a trigger, and I was locked on. The other guy was going up and down, and as soon as he was locked onto the target, huh. he'd pull the trigger. We, uh, at the time when we pulled the trigger, we'd, we'd announce locked on, and the lieutenant behind us would have the authority to fire, so he would fire. So him. was he like the gunnery officer or right. something? Exactly. Okay. I see. So were you, tra uh, I assume you had some training, got some training from on the, the fire? Job, on the job training. On the job training. Yeah. So you, uh, did you enjoy that, I mean the job, the work? Not on the command cruiser. No, we, we'd probably never fire a gun. Uh, we had Russian submarines following us every place we went. They, uh, because of the importance of the right, precisely because that's where the president might be. Yeah. Well, we had a communications uh, a system on board that the Russians wanted to know all about it. It was state of the art at the time. It was called the Tropo system, and it had a huge mast on the ship. And what ha what happened was uh, the electronic signal would go up to the tropopause. Do you know what that is? I've heard it, but you know what? Is something in the atmosphere? Yeah, there's a there's a space in the atmosphere with the with the uh, at, uh, the uh, environment changes. Uh, we lose three degrees Fahrenheit temperature for every thousand feet we climb, and at about sixty or seventy thousand feet, it changes from three degrees to one degree. Okay. And that creates a blanket where radio frequency will bounce off of. And somebody figured this out, and they shoot communications up to the tropopause, and it could be received, depending on your equipment, anywhere on the East Coast or the West Coast. <coughs> and um, it was, like I said, it was, it was the state of the art. There were only, uh, I think, two or three stations that, that could receive on the East Coast. One was in Florida, Washington, and Maine. And we could be anywhere in the Atlantic. And, it was. It would be like talking on the telephone to your next door neighbor. Hmm. So it was. It was. Uh, the Russians wanted to know all about it. I bet they did. I bet they did. So, so when did you start on the Northampton? Approximately was that sixty uh, six? Sixty-five. Uh, no, sixty-six. Sixty-six. Um, I think it was around September. Of sixty-six. Right. Okay. And and. And where um, did you stay relatively close? You must have stayed relatively close to uh, home base? Norfolk, Virginia, right. Just we in were, case. We were going out two weeks at a time and returning out to sea two weeks at a time. In other words, one of the two ships had to be at sea at all times. Right. With the idea that the president would be exactly well, I'm sorry, was it t was the mode that he'd be ferried out by helicopter Precisely. to the ship? Precisely. Okay, not join the ship when it was berthed. No, but at sea. Right. Okay. Well, yes, I can understand the spit and polish and. Uh, yeah, uh, that got to me. <laughs> so there must have been drills, for when the president or, uh, you know, when 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 this might happen. Yeah, well, actually, Johnson did come aboard uh, before I got on board. And it was up off of uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and they ferried him out by helicopter, and him and his daughter, uh, I don't know which one it was, uh, stayed for 24 hours 
just as a drill. As a drill, huh? And um, they seem to enjoy themselves, and they thanked everybody and whatever. And uh, they went home. <laughs> I would have said good riddance because life in that 24 hours must have been miserable for everybody. Well, I'm sure they were very happy, but others were probably uh, yeah. yeah busy. Yeah, I, well, one, once I got sick of it, it was about eight months later, I got sick of it, and I, I, wanted, I wanted to see the real Navy. I didn't but when you came in to port every couple of weeks, uh, then you ba did you get to leave the ship, or were you basically on the ship all the time? No, no. Uh, there were a bunch of guys that had uh, rented a, a, a summer cot or a cottage on, uh, in Newport News, Virginia. And, um, you know, basically it was a party house. You know, you get out and somebody would buy a case of beer and we'd be there all weekend and go back to work on Monday morning. So that made the duty, uh, that took, took some of the edge off of the right. challenge at work. Right. Other than having the police visit every now and then, it was pretty nice. <laughs> um, so you started that in in '66, right? Did you say September? Something like that, yeah. Okay. And how long? When did you uh, I move left, on from that? I left that uh, May or June of '66, '67. May or June of '67. Yeah, and was assigned. I was actually assigned. I asked for a transfer, <clears throat> and I wanted. Uh, uh, a smaller ship, because there was like a thousand, fifteen hundred people on this ship, and I, I don't like that at all. Anyway, um, they offered me uh, a brand new ship out of uh, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, I think, and um, I, they they told me it had to go through sea trials and whatever, and they were going to take a world tour to show everybody how slick the Navy is. I said, I don't think so. I'm leaving a Spitzering place and I don't like that stuff at all. So. <clears throat> and then I turned that down and I, the second one they gave me was uh, the USS Eaton. Eaton? Eaton, E-A-T-O-N. It was DD-510. 510. It was built in, uh, 19, I got it here. It was built in 1943 and um, it was a Fletcher class destroyer. <clears throat> Let me find it here. USS North Eight. It was built in 1942. It was active until 1969. It had a crew of about 250 people. It had uh, five five-inch guns, ten 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns and seven 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Had an ASROC at one time, but that was taken off when I was there. It was involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion, and um, that was pretty exciting, actually. They, were, they, had a, um, they had a ship's reunion that I went to, and they introduced me to this guy. His name was Sanchez. He, uh, he was a Cuban refugee. He was part of the Cuban invasion, um, and he had a terrible story. They forced him to be part of uh, the Cuban invasion, but um, the United States government forced him to be. Uh, but anyway, he uh, escaped the uh, invasion and the, the Cuban army, and he walked the shoreline going towards Havana. And um, he was signaling out to sea for somebody to pick him up, any fisherman or anything. And it was the USS Eaton that, that saw him. So they sent a whale boat in, picked him up, and brought him, and he was only 18, 19 years old. Mm. Uh, brought him out and, and uh, stripped him down, made sure he didn't have lice or anything like that. And uh, gave him uniform and uh, gave him cigarettes and, and coffee and kept him on the ship until they returned to Norfolk.
That's great. Yeah, That's great. and he uh, he 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 was actually made a, a citizen almost immediately. But um, I mean, his story was was pretty profound. But um, that was in 1961, I think. One. Uh, anyway, my uh, my ship was sunk in 1970 off the coast of Norfolk. Sunk? Uh, you mean uh, sunk? Scud scuttled. Scuttled. It was. Uh, <coughs> it had no more use. It, I guess a navy ship only lasts 25, 30 years. So where did you? So you joined the Eaton in Norfolk. Norfolk, Virginia, right? In later 67 or. 67. Yeah, May. Like mid, mid, May. May. Yeah. yeah, okay. And, and uh, uh, it was it was going to Vietnam and everybody knew it. And you were still a fire control technician. Right, okay. exactly. Which meant that you had some duty, some important duties coming up. Well, uh, <laughs> if you call it important painting and routine maintenance. Well, I'm talking about, I assume you, well, okay, we'll, we'll get to Vietnam. I'm sure you had plenty of uh, grunt work to do too, right. but how long did it take you to get to? Did you go directly to Vietnam from uh, or to? No, it was uh, it was May. We left in mid June, I think it was, and we <coughs> uh, went down through the Caribbean, uh, through the Panama Canal, stopped in uh, in Panama for a, a couple of days. We stopped in a place called Manzanilla, Mexico. Um, uh, that was pretty interesting. It was that was like uh, they had donkeys pulling fuel hoses to the ship. Uh, hmm. I, I mean, it was arcane. But uh, we went to uh, we stopped off in uh, uh, Long Beach, and we got our first exposure to uh, swift boats there. Um, to what? Swift boats. Oh, sw the swift boats. Yeah, the uh, uh, I think they. It, they sent around a, a squadron of uh, uh, PBRs, the Patrol Boat River. Those were the newest uh, version of PT boats. And um, they did exercises in the harbor, dropping hand grenades and, no, and telling nobody. I mean, they actually told the, the command, but if you were below decks and you had these explosions going off, you got a little worried. Mm. And that's exactly where I was, below decks and... I'm in Long Beach. Right. Anyway, we At the na Naval Station, at the Long Beach Naval right. Station. Exactly. And we, uh, we went to uh, Hawaii after that, stopped in Midway, Guam, and then uh, the Philippines. We were rearmed with uh, 30 millimeter and 50 millimeter uh, machine guns because they knew we were going to go close in. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we were a sacrificial goat. I mean, we, we did things other people wouldn't do because we were old. We, you mean the ship? Yeah, yeah, it's always we. <laughs> I wouldn't do this myself. But uh, we, uh, we went up the Saigon River. Uh, you know, a few ships of my size did. I was going to say that's a. I I really don't know the river, but it's a why it's a like the it's Mississippi. A, it's I mean, a big it, river. Yeah, but, but but you can reach. You the take ship. a warship on it. Uh, yeah. it's it's like uh, you know you can reach it with small arms or or or, or um, mortars or, or RPGs or something. You're vulnerable. Right, exactly. But they don't really challenge uh, big ships. I mean, at least the Viet Cong didn't. Unless well, it's hard to, I mean, they don't really have the armament to really do much damage, right? Or they can pick right. off somebody, but exactly. okay. anyway. But, you know, we were, we were trying to clear paths for cargo ships because that was one of the biggest, big, uh, busiest ports in the world at the time. I bet it was. 67, right? Yeah. Huge buildup. Right. <clears throat> the only one that rivaled it was Cameron Bay. Yes. And that one, that one became the... Uh, the busiest <coughs> port in the world at its peak. But uh, yeah, it was it was kind of interesting across the Pacific. Uh, so how how long did it take you to get from uh, Norfolk to what is it, to South China Sea? Yeah, that uh, um, probably about a month. A month. Well, when we pulled into Subic Bay, we uh, 
uh, we were there when the forest stall pulled in. The forest stall had been uh, torn apart by uh, an accident on board. Oh. Well, they called it an accident. It was um, uh, McC McCain was John McCain was uh, involved in it. You mean uh, the, the the admiral or the uh, no. or the fly the pilot uh, the Senator command, McCain the com the commander at the time. <coughs> He, uh, his airplane was hit with uh, some missile. His missiles exploded. He jumped off the, uh, his uh, pilot seat and rolled off the nose of the airplane. And uh, he watched a bunch of people trying to put out the fire and something like 160 guys died. And it was kind of sad because this was a full-size airplane, a full-size aircraft carrier. Right. And it was like, <coughs> it came in on its own power, but it was like watching a ship with its entrails dragging behind it. Hmm. I mean, it was disgusting. And it was the first time I saw uh, uh, men of war, or other ships like ours, uh, fly their flag upside down. And I didn't know what that meant. Hmm. And what does that mean? Well, it, it means, uh, uh, I asked the chief, I didn't, I didn't have any way to look it up. The chief said it means uh, the nation's in trouble or profound sadness. It cannot mean anything else. So outside. was this because of all the people who were killed? Uh, and the state of the ship. And the state of the ship. Yeah. I mean, it pulled up and everybody turned <coughs> their flags upside down. And this was in Subic Bay in the Subic, Philippines? Exactly. <coughs> <clears throat> so, what did you do? And uh, so, how long were you sort of working off the coast of Vietnam or in the Saigon River? Once we, uh, once we were there, we uh, we worked eighteen to twenty, twenty-two hours a day. You slept whenever you could. I mean, whenever you could. If you had a half an hour for lunch, you, you swallowed that in, in two or three gulps, <laughs> put your head down and slept. I mean, you were walking around. You, I mean, you knew your job. So were you at general quarters all the time? Uh, quite I a mean, bit I, of time. I kind of remember that from my Navy day. Uh. Yeah, quite a bit of the time. There was general quarters and there was a relaxed general quarters. Uh, when we were firing gunfire support, for the Marines or the, the Army in, in the uh, Delta. It was a relaxed form of uh, our general quarters. When we were uh, in North Vietnam, rushing the beach, uh, that was full, full general quarters because they were shooting that back at us. Which is basically the highest state of alert. Right, exactly. Okay. They were, they were, we, we, were uh, we were given uh, identified targets. There were stationary targets, gun implants, or, or, or uh, fuel dumps or ammo dumps or road uh, or junctions, anything that would produce uh, military uh, results we fired at. And um, we operated um, with the USS New Jersey. Battleship. Right, uh, uh, BB-61 I think it was. Anyway, uh, they were 12, 15 miles out to sea. They weren't going to get fired at. However, <clears throat> the squadron that I was a part of would rush the beach, you know, zigzag so they couldn't, didn't have any stable targets to, to shoot at. And we would come in as close as a mile off the beach. Really? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we could see their guns going off. And um, when... Uh, this was Viet. Uh, this was. North you're talking about the beach of North Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Well, it's, I mean, this was a war. I mean, you know. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> we didn't. There were no tourists up there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, the, 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 uh, one of the POWs was a, a tin can sailor like myself. Fell off the ship got uh, captured by a fisherman and turned into his government. Really? He, he got, he got, uh, he acted stupid, like he was a moron, 
he, he did that on purpose so that they wouldn't badger him or, or, or torture him. <coughs> but uh, he was the one that memorized all the prisoners of war that they had in control. And he was one of the first ones to be released. And because he took the time to, to memorize this, oh. he got the Silver Star. Because he was able to provide this information once he was Precisely. released. And he did it in a form of a song. He couldn't memorize all the names because some of them were the same. So he memorized it in the form of a song and he started singing the song and the, and the guy, and the guy that, the yeoman that's writing it down <coughs> says, can you slow down? He said, no, I can't. You gotta record this because I don't remember it any other way. Let me get the silver star for it. So you, so, so you were patrolling off the coast of North Vietnam. Actually, it wasn't a patrol. It was a or, it was, or a, it was an aggressive station. action. R right. It was called Operation Sea Dragon. So it was an oper It was a military operation. Exactly. Was it in conjunction with bombing, uh, like B fifty twos? Well, not B fifty twos, but you know uh, the the stuff that that was coming off of a Yankee station. If they were fired on on the way out or the way in, they would identify the spots. At the time, there were no SAMS missiles. So well, there, were, there were SAMS missiles, but they were new. They were Russian-made. And um, they, they weren't worried about, they were worried about anti-aircraft fire. Sure. And, um, you know, if they, they <coughs> came across a cluster of bursts, they would identify the area, and somebody else would come over and high fly, U-2s would fly over photograph everything and, and mark down the locations, and we would fire on them. So then that's where your job came in. Right. So did, I mean, tell us a little bit about, I mean, as, as part of this military operation, this op what was the name of the operation? Operation Sea Dragon. Okay, so what, describe your involvement in that as a fire control technician. What gives a scenario of kind of what would happen? Well, um, in the mornings we would get uh, briefings from the uh, uh, Admiralty and, uh, or the Yankee Station. They'd tell us where to go and, and uh, what kind of fire that they expected. And surprisingly enough, we used uh, white phosphorus, Willie Peter. And uh, I guess that's illegal now. White phosphorus? Shells. Shells. Yeah. White phosphorus is nasty, nasty Terrible stuff. Terrible burning, uh, right. Well, you can't even put it out. You, can, you put it under water, it still burns. Anybody touches it, it it's go right through you. <coughs> but uh, evidently it's illegal now. But uh, we fired that quite a bit um, for obvious reasons. You know, if you start a fire, they can't put it out. That gives you a, another spot to, uh, another identification area to fire on if it were productive. If it was just burning a building, you wouldn't care. But if it was a, uh, if it was a <coughs> fuel dump, you would care, so you would want to, you know, bury it. But uh, we, we fired once on Sea Dragon that was, uh, that was kind of hokey for me. I, 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 I didn't understand. I mean, you know, I, 20 year old kid, 19 year old kid, he, you know, this is a joke. But um, we fired, uh, ran the beach, and it got dark and ran the beach again. And um, the captain came over the one MC and he, uh, he said, uh, anybody below decks that wants to come up and watch the war, uh, you've got a half an hour. I watch the war. I mean, I, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me. <coughs> anyway, uh, what happened was uh, we hit a fuel dump and we could see, and I was in the main barrier, the top box in the, on the ship. Right. And I, I could see everything. <coughs> and there was about, uh, something like five to 10 degrees of the horizon on fire. And you could see it from miles out to sea. A North Vietnamese fuel or ammunition depot. Whatever it was. Uh, I mean, 
I, we were never told, you know, good job, this, that, and the other. It was, uh, it, it was pretty eye-opening, you know, it was pretty, holy crap, I could die here, you know. Right. Uh, and you, you're thinking, I, I was projecting myself in that position. Right. How the hell do you survive it? Right. Well. But meanwhile, you were busy up doing your thing with the controls and the azimuths and the right. all this thing. Right. Um, we were constantly looking through it to, to identify targets on the beach or even inland. And you were looking, I mean, you could actually see the, I mean, were you visi visually sighting the yeah. targets? Right. Okay. I mean, if, I, if we saw a, 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 a flash report, we would localize it, you know, lock on to it and say, I think this is, a, this is a gun that's firing. And we'd pass the information down to the captain and they'd say, okay, we'll give it a couple of rounds and see what happens. You know, if it goes bang, bang and secondary explosions, we got our target. If it doesn't do anything, it was nothing. So how long did you, how long were you uh, off the coast of Vietnam? Well, uh, that's hard to say because it, uh, we went from one operation to another. There was another operation uh, off the coast of uh, the DMZ. They called it uh, market time, I think it was. Market, I think it was market time. Um, it was searching junks and ha uh, sampans to um, uh, to interdict um, small arms and and explosives going down to south, going down south. So you were searching, yeah, sampans, right? That were out in the South China Sea. Well, mostly junks. Sampans are a little small. Okay, but uh, they were they were larger larger ships, larger boats. So what's involved in that? Shotguns and and uh, searching things, you know tearing people's property apart, making friends and welcoming neighbors. <laughs> right, the, the, right, the hearts and minds. Yeah, right. yeah, we were tearing them up pretty good. Uh, we never found anything, because the Coast Guard did a pretty good job of, of uh, what we were doing. So the, the U.S. Coast Guard? Yeah, they were there. So was that their prime, I mean, was that their was, primary job? That, that was one of their primary jobs, yeah. But, but you came in to what supplement there? Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So you went up the Saigon River at one point yeah. to provide, or to clear, basically be a lead for the cargo ship. Clear path, right? Clear path. You were doing uh, interdiction work in the DMZ and probably other places. You were firing uh, part of an active operation off of North Vietnam. Right. Um, Gunfire support was uh, um, in the Delta, the Mekong Delta. Uh, we were supporting the SEALs and the uh, Riverines. So you would get stuff from a air, from a from a, from, a, from a controller of some kind who would call in. Either an Air Force controller, a Navy controller, or uh, somebody on the ground. Right. Uh, you know, anybody on the ground can ask for a fast mover to, to bomb something, but if they can't get a fast mover, they'll ask for somebody on the coast. If we were available, we would shoot. What's a fast mover? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, like a jet, like a plane? Exactly. I. Planes were all over the South Vietnam, all over the place. Just for that purpose, to Just provide yeah. uh, protection or Pretty get nice. people out of jams. Yeah. Yankee Station, there was the, we, we only know it as Yankee Station, but before I got there, I guess there was a Dixie Station also. Yankee Station for, was to launch airplanes to bomb North Vietnam. Dixie Station was to support South, uh, South Vietnam. They did away with Dixie Station at one point, and it was only Yankee Station. Okay. And, um, <coughs> in, uh, let's see, it was November... I have a picture of this, uh, November 19th, or October 19th, 1967, 
uh, a photograph was taken of my ship, another smaller ship, and the USS Oriskany. An aircraft carrier? Yes. Uh, John McCain was transferred from the um, Fitz, uh, Forrestal to the Oriskany um, in July or August or whatever. And um, what happened was he was shot down on October 26, 1967. Oh, okay. Oh. So I was there the day he got shot down. Mm. <clears throat> and it's kind of funny because I, uh, you know, we, we when you chase a chari uh, carrier in in um, a Yankee station, you have absolutely nothing to do unless an airplane goes into the water, or you got to pick up a flyer. Oh, that's the purpose. Right, I, exactly. I, or or even if somebody falls off the ship, you got to pick them up, and um, but otherwise you're just sitting around talking to each other. And, but it was breakfast time, I, I remember, and uh, I had a cup of coffee, and there's a bunch of guys in the forecastle, and I think there's a picture of it uh, on, on the ship's website. And I was just sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, and I said, I wonder who's not coming home today. And years later, I'm thinking, Jesus, that might have been McCain. So it was, it was kind of interesting. But I showed McCain twice. Um, uh, the second time I met him, I, I, I said I was on Yankee Station, October 26, 67. And he looked at me and he said, why didn't you come after me? And I said, your father wouldn't let us. His father was in command of the... Of the I know. <laughs> so, and he got a big kick out of that. It was well, when he said, why didn't you come after me? He yeah. had been captured in North Vietnam, right? Right. Yeah. Why so what did he, he mean? Why come didn't after he me? come after him? I, you know, he could have. We could have gone in. Oh, you mean blazing. you, as in the U.S. forces, right? Exactly. Somehow come in and rescue him. Yeah, your father wouldn't let us. Wow. Yeah. Funny how history. Is, uh, anyway, um, that was uh, that was an unusual incident, and I, I and I remembered it because I, I actually said, "I wonder who's not coming home today." And it was daily that those people were getting shot down. I know. Uh, and this was during the buildup for Tet. After, Which happened in 68. Uh, yeah, right. January of 68, exactly. But um, that was uh, rather frightening. That, uh, we were involved in, in the biggest buildup that North Vietnamese had in, in the entire war. So it was, uh, it was kind of, uh, we didn't know it at the time. Right. We were blowing things up that could have been used to uh, kill Americans or anybody else. Yeah. But it was... Uh, it's a very interesting aspect of the war that doesn't get, I mean, the, the whole naval support activity. Yeah. Um, which you were very much a part of. Yeah, well, one of, these, one <coughs> of, the, guy, one of the things that happened was that uh, we had to pick up a, a, a South Vietnamese uh, uh, I think it was a captain or something, to interpret for searching junks. And uh, no, I'm sorry, interpret for? Interpret for, for the Vietnamese language. For, for, the, for the searching, right? Yeah. And nobody <clears throat> liked the guy. Nobody liked him at all. He was, uh, he was aloof. He, um, I, I think he resented the United States uh, or the military thinking that he could do it himself and so, well, he couldn't do anything. And actually, when I, once I got back, uh, more than one person said we were fighting on the wrong side. The communists were, were much more brave and, and, and uh, together than, than the South Vietnamese. And, and of course they were right, the South Vietnamese were corrupt. The, uh, the North Vietnamese were, were dedicated what you know? What could you do? Well, you couldn't do anything. So, did you were, were you on the ship at all times, or did you ever uh... go on on the beach? Yeah, we went on the beach in Vung Tau. We would uh, we only allowed four hours, and we were supposed to be back by ten o'clock. <laughs> and they told us when we got on board, when we got, uh, hit the beach, they said if you're not back here 
by 10 o'clock, we cannot protect you. He said, what do you mean? You can't protect us. <clears throat> we weren't carrying weapons. And they said, uh, at mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, the VC come in and have a nice time. I said, what the hell is that? Evidently, the VC used Wang Tao as an R&R &R area. And they allowed them to come in and get drunk and chase women and stuff, you know, whatever. I said, wow, this is crazy. This, is, this doesn't make any sense. But it, was, it happened. And I made sure I was back by 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. Yeah. So did you do that several times? Or? No, no, just once. One time? Just one time. As a matter of fact, we anchored uh, off the coast uh, of Vantau, and we had to take the whaleboat into uh, uh, the R&R, &R um, well, the Liberty, and um, the, one, uh, the one time uh, we tried to pull it up mechanically, the uh, motor didn't work. Hmm. So we had to pull up the uh, anchor by hand. Do you know anything about that? I don't. But that doesn't sound like fun. No, it isn't. There's a there's a capstan that right. R you crank it around and yeah, and the rope you, or the chain. Is this a chain or a rope? No, it's a chain, uh, a big one. And um, there's there's wooden pegs that go into that capstan, and you're like a a, a donkey or a, a horse and pulling it around, and um, you couldn't do that all the time. You rotated guys, you know. You'd do one rotation and another crew and another crew, and then you'd do another rotation. It was miserable. And like course, you said, you were young at the time. Yeah, right. Well, young and stupid, you know, like, <laughs> bulletproof too. But That's right. the, the thing is, we could have we could have been shot at at that at that time. And, right. And you know, we were stupid enough to to uh, do something like that or whatever. How did you like life in the Navy as a enlisted person? Did you feel pretty good about your the command structure and uh, you know? Uh, well, um, all of that. The command structure was a little odd. We had some. We had one guy who graduated. He was an ensign. He graduated West Point or uh, West uh, Annapolis, and he was pretty cool. Uh, we had another guy who was the XO. And instead of having pictures of his family and, you know, pictures of his girlfriend and stuff, he had pictures of cows. Hmm. Jesus Christ, like, I don't know how to deal with this. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is life and, you know. Was he a farmer? I have absolutely no idea. I didn't go into him. I mean, he didn't, you know, I didn't converse with the XO very often. But, um, no, th those people were... It was a caste system. And I, I understand the chain of command and you have to keep your distance because you have to make a decision whether somebody lives or dies and stuff. I understand all of that stuff. But, my God, pictures of cows? Uh, I mean, the only thing I could compare it to was some enlisted men had pictures of their motorcycles or cars that they drove in the streets, <coughs> you know, from New York and stuff. But I couldn't understand cows. That, um, that was odd to me. What was your uh, rank or? Uh, E3. Your, what's that? E3, seaman. E3, right, got it. And you, so, uh, so you were on station, basically, what, a total of, uh, I mean, how long a time before you came back? Came back? It was, uh, uh, I think it was just after Christmas of 67 that we started back. And um, <coughs> it was uh, late January when we got into uh, Norfolk. And I remember this because uh, the day before we pulled into port, the USS Pueblo was captured. Oh. Yeah, and that... North Korea. Uh, North Korea. And they, uh, that kind of bothered us. It bothered me particularly because I was getting out. And I said, I don't want anything to do with going back to Asia. 
that's no fun at all. <coughs> anyway, I, uh, I left the ship, they, dis they separated me, and I stayed in New York with a, uh, an old girlfriend of mine who happened to be a ballerina. It was a good three weeks, but then I decided I was out of money and I went home to Winthrop. And back to Winthrop. And the Navy did call. <coughs> they wanted me back in to, to uh, uh, drill and, and uh, maybe active duty. And I said, no way. Uh, this is not going to happen. He said, well, we can force you. And I says, do your forcing because I'm not going back. I said, those people are dying over there. <coughs> then uh, what was strange is, and this, I couldn't get over this, my, my, and I'm still not over it. My father accused me of letting my country down when they needed me the most. And you know what I said to him. And it was, wasn't pleasant, and it was, I mean, I didn't have many, many constructive conversations with him after that. And my sister, I didn't see my sister until, um, April, you know, spring break or whatever it was. Of 68. Yeah, she was in college. And, and she didn't say, hi, it's nice to have you back. She didn't say anything like that. She said, did you kill any babies? And I said, well, I, and, I, and I, I don't know where this came from, or right off the top of my head. I said, I don't remember killing any babies, but I do remember killing people your age. Ooh, she didn't like that. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen her in 40 years. I haven't even talked to her in 40 years. And I don't have any desire to, because she's a moron. You can't pick your relatives. You can only choose your friends. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about, I mean, that's, that's a tough deal. That happened all but, the I mean, time. But I mean, it, right, but I, you know, I was going to ask you, I mean, the Vietnam War, to say the least, the Vietnam War was controversial. The political, you, 67, 68, was getting to be the height of it. Mm -hmm. And you really suffered something there with well, your family. We, um, well, not only that, we were, we were on the edge of a second war in, in um, I think it was August of 67. The, uh, the Israelis blew up the USS Liberty. And they killed about 18, 20 guys, and, and uh, uh, nobody did anything. And then all of a sudden, the rumor went around the entire Navy that we, my ship involved, <coughs> were going to go through the Persian Gulf and into uh, the Mediterranean to fight somebody. And I said, who the hell are we going to fight? I don't want to fight anybody. They didn't do anything to me. But, you know, it's... Uh, I'm involved in the Navy, and I got to stay with it. Right, but fortunately, that didn't happen. No, that didn't happen. That would have been a, around the world tour, and we would have gone through the Suez and all so forth. And um, but uh, no, that didn't happen. And thank God it didn't. Did you get any other uh, uh, re reactions? from friends or people or strangers or citizens in terms of your military service, Vietnam, um, positive, negative? Well, I had a, a good friend who was a Marine recon. And uh, he was stationed out of Da Nang. And um, he was telling me some of the stories. You know, veterans won't talk to uh, people that don't have similar experiences. But uh, he was telling me some of the stories of, of some of the people he had to kill. And uh, they were pretty gruesome. Choking a 13-year-old boy with his hands because he couldn't reach his weapon. Um, considering executing one of his own people because he had a big mouth. Couldn't keep his mouth shut in a, in a secure area. Um, I mean, there were some vicious stories. Uh, I'm pretty glad I wasn't part of them. But, right. And there was another guy. He was <laughs> a, a, a friend of mine. He was a, a Green Beret. He was uh, he was kind of a wild kid. 
he uh, he was uh, one of these take a chance and come what may. And uh, he served a couple of years as a Green Beret, and he came back. And I said, what the hell is the matter with you? Why, did you like it? He said, yeah, I loved it. But I like alcohol better. So he was an alcoholic. I see, yeah. I mean, he was an alcoholic for the rest of his life. And he had to talk about uh, blowing up his own people, too. North, uh, South Vietnamese regulars, or South Vietnamese uh, army. But it's, I mean, you talk about it like it was opening a can of tomato soup or something. I said, no, that's not good. I mean, I was hurt a couple of times, and I didn't like it. I mean, you know, you can smell that blood in your nose, and uh, that's not good at all. You were hurt on, uh, when you were on ship? Yeah, I, you know, just banged around a little bit. Right. Um, one time I was uh, almost washed to sea. Huh. Um, we were rearming uh, in the middle of the day, I guess, uh, and when you're through, they cut the lines and the lines get drawn back to the ship, so forth and so on, and you st stay parallel until you're ready to break off, and once you break off, you go one way and they go the other. Right. And I was on the low side of the, 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 the ship when they broke off. Of course, the water comes up over the. We were only two feet above the water. Right, right. I get the water it. comes up, took my feet out from under me, and slid me all the way down to the fantail. The only thing that saved me, that kept me on board, was that rope webbing. My legs went through it, and I lost my shoes. <laughs> and I was soaking wet, and I was trying to catch my breath because I had swallowed some seawater. But you saved your skin. Oh gosh. I mean, that was pretty close. It was. And they wouldn't have known anything until about a half hour, 45 minutes later, because they don't, they don't muster in until after it's all over and they're, you know, everything is secure. And there was no, nobody else around. Right. Yeah. So, it, you know, I had my share of close calls. Well, shipboard life, just absent combat, is, is itself hazardous. Well, right? I got to tell you something, how, how hazardous it is. You know, when you live with 250 guys in real close quarters, some habits get annoying, and some people get annoying. And this one guy, he was uh, half Indian, half Mexican uh, culturally. He's an American citizen, but half U.S. Indian or Mexican Indian and, and uh, Mexican. Anyway, he got in a fight with somebody. He spoke Spanish, and I, you know, we were pretty friendly. He spoke, and, and he got in a fight with this other guy. Then I don't remember what the other guy was. But this moron picked up a wrench, and he was about to crown this guy. And I stopped his hand from going down with the wrench with my arm. And I said, get rid of that weapon. I said, you can beat the hell out of him with your fist, but you don't pull the weapon on the guy because he, you're, you're going to lose. And believe it or not, I forgot this incident until I had talked to him about four or five years ago. And he thanked me for saving his life. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? And he told me about the incident. He said, oh, yeah, I remember that. Huh. Came so out there's, blue. right, close quarters, uh, tempers, uh, yeah. Yeah, and getting washed and what, overboard, falling what, down, falling and, down a ladder, fall, uh, whatever. Right. Well, at one point, I, you know, we were at this relaxed uh, combat and gunfire support, and nobody is going to tell me that the gun is going to go off, but the concussion from the the firing of the gun goes all over the place. Well, I'm on the the fan tail, and there's a couple of doors. It 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 goes like. Uh, um, you know, a pentagram or something. It goes like this and then squares off and then there's a gun. And there are doors here where they go sleeping quarters or uh, workshops. And I'm in one of the doors. So I go to move out and um, I don't know if you know it or not, but you, you, don't, you don't just open a door in, on a, um, a hatch, actually, uh, on a ship at sea. You gotta put your foot down <laughs> because this door could slam on you. Right. Well, I put my foot down and my arm out and I pushed the door 
and all of a sudden the gun goes off and the concussion of the gun blew the door shut. Drove me to the other door. It was about 30 feet away. I said, geez. Wow. I mean, I could have been outside and blown my eardrums out. But uh, it was that bad. It was, uh, you know, accidents happen all the time. Right, right, right. So when you got out, you, did you, you were in the reserves? No. Well, I, I, uh, my enlistment was called a two by six. A uh, total of six years, two years of reserve, of, of uh, drilling and, and two, two weeks out to sea, and two weeks active duty, and then two, uh, two years of active duty, and then two years of inactive duty. I said, well, that's good, you know, I'll do that. And, um, but they didn't tell me they were pre gonna pressure me to go back and, uh, and I was having no part of it. I couldn't find a job. And they said, oh, we pay you. I said, you pay me peanuts, you know. I couldn't feed a dog with what you pay me. Anyway, um, I, uh, I refused to go and I, I tried to be a policeman at one point. That didn't work. Um, I tried to go to the post office and I found that boring. I ended up, um, <clears throat> there were a bunch of us who had served in Vietnam, um, kind of troublemakers in high school. And um, this is a story I, did, I haven't told in a long time, but uh, there were about 60 of us that were drafted all at the same time. And uh, the principal of the high school went to the draft board and they, he said, these boys need some discipline. And it was all of us. And we all got a notice to, to, to be drafted at the same time. And nobody knew what happened until after we came back. Anyway, we're, some of us were still alive and together, or not shot. And we uh, were hanging around in the corner smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and stuff. And this uh, old politician walks by and uh, he stops and looks at us up and down. He says, why don't you bums get a job? Ooh, wrong thing to say. <laughs> um, hmm. And I level, I open my mouth and I give him what's for. and. Uh, he bowed his back and he said, tomorrow morning I want each and every one of you in my office at 9 o'clock. You'll have a job. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he got me a job at uh, Northeast Airlines and I stayed there 28 years. Wow. Yeah. But I dropped the F-bomb in him and I told him what to, what to do with himself. <laughs> so he didn't, so, so all of you were vets. Yeah. Were Vietnam vets. Right. And, um... Wow. Yeah, that's, this, this that's, guy, that's quite a story. Well, this guy was, you know, he was trying to be funny, but you, you don't tell that to somebody that comes back from combat and wants you to yeah, guy's got a job. So what, what was he, was he a mayor, the mayor or something? No, or? He, was a, he was a politician. He, um, he had a big job in the Volpe administration. Uh, he was a big deal <coughs> real estate agent, insurance agent in town, and, you know. Everybody knew who he was, right. and you know. But he got you uh, on track. Right. I guess it's a good thing you said what you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. Good for you. Hey, you say the right things at the right time, whatever's appropriate. It, it, like, like I told you, it depends on who I'm talking to. Right. You know, you give me attitude, I'll give you attitude. Well, what back, you know, uh, uh, how, how important to you was serving in the military? In well, terms of your, your life, your, the d direction uh, you took in your life. Well, that's a, that's a pretty interesting question and it's kind of involved with the answer. I did a lot of things, uh, good and bad, from Vietnam on and, and before, even before Vietnam. But every single thing I did gave me some sort of a discipline that I didn't have in the past. 
And uh, one of the things that happened to me was um, my health was starting to fall apart in 1970. Well, it, it was immediately in, in 1968. But in 1970, it started getting serious. I couldn't feel my fingertips. Anyway, I went to a neurologist and he said, uh, we don't know what you have, but uh, uh, go home and let the uh, symptoms develop. And uh, I said, well, are you stupid? What do I got? Give me a pill. And he said, no. He says, we don't know what you have. And, and he wouldn't tell me myosthemia gravis or multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or whatever, because he didn't want to frighten me. Well, I started reading. And then I went to college and got a degree in uh, aviation science. And I, I got a pilot's license, and I got every pilot's license I can get except for the air transport pilot, which is a, a, an airline pilot. And, um, but even that was a waste of my time other than the discipline it gave me to focus. Um, I, ca I continued going to college, and, and I went to uh, uh, out to Salt Lake City. I went to a community college out there and University of Utah, and that, that was a waste. But um, whenever I needed information, I went back to college and took a couple of courses. And I ended up with uh, a degree out there, a degree back here, and the equivalent of another two degrees in uh, associate degrees in uh, medicine and law. And there's a, there was another one in art, but I didn't really pursue it. But um, I started looking at my own problems, my own physical problems. And uh, then I found out by accident that we were being poisoned by Agent Orange while we were there. Mm. And I said, I don't remember being rained on by a chemical. However, we would draw in water from the Tonkin Gulf. And the water, whatever they sprayed on the trees in the jungles in South Vietnam <coughs> flowed outriver into the bay and we got caught with it. And we're drawing the water in, we're cooking, eating, drinking, and showering. And we didn't know this. Nobody knew it. Actually, the government wouldn't even recognize it until Fukushima. Fukushima, there was an aircraft carrier, I think it was a Lincoln, and they were drawing water, radioactive water from the sea, and it was being, and everybody on board got sick. Now they figured out it applied to Vietnam, too. Ah, is that, is that right? But it took that long, too. Well, it took quite, quite a while. Right. Anyway, um, I looked at that and I said, that's a poisoning. That's not a microorganism, that's not a trauma. That's a poisoning. And I looked at the ingredients of, uh, of uh, defoliants and, and uh, pesticides and herbicides and so forth and so on. And I found that a lot of them contain heavy metals. Arsenic, lead, <coughs> cadmium, mercury, so forth and so on. And I started looking at, I was told by Linus Pauling, actually, I read his book, that there are 10,000 new chemicals developed every year, or every month. 1,000 a month, 10,000 a year. I said, no, that's, that's a waste of time. I can't look at every chemical. I'm, I'm not even a chemical engineer. But heavy metals is a different story. I know what they are. And there are only 35 metals. And heavy metals are defined as any metal weighing more than water five or six times more than water, actually. So I started looking at all the, the metals, and I found that 23 of them are considered heavy metals, and we are exposed to between six and 10 every single day of our lives, and nobody knows where they're coming from, hmm. nobody. So I started reading about heavy metals. I said, geez, this is too good to be true. I mean, this is too simple an answer. Anyway, I, I wrote a paper and, and uh, turned it into a book. And it's, uh, it's called Illness Defined, The Theorem. And in it, I define illness 
in simple terms that anybody can, can, can use. And um, as a matter of fact, I produced a, a protocol that uh, if once it's accepted, if medicine doesn't recognize it, they're subject to lawsuit. Because if they don't know, they should know. And the protocol goes like this. If you have a disease or a condition that has no identified cause and no prescribed cure, the probability of being influenced by one or more of the heavy metals is severe. If you have all three vectors of illness, meaning microorganism, trauma, and poisoning, if you don't eliminate the, the influence of a metal, you will never be cured. Hmm. And I show it to people, and say, Jesus, that's, that's pretty, pretty serious, it's pretty deep. Yeah, well, pay attention to it. You know, what do you got, right. Parkinson's disease? Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, on and on and on. Hives, asthma, what was the cause? Well, we don't know. Well, what's the cure? Well, there's no cure, it's a treatment. Wrong, you were poisoned. Hmm. So that, that was the benefit of being, being uh, in Vietnam. Interesting. I got a discipline that, that uh, cannot be beat, can't can be taken away from me. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, looking back on it all, you know, do you have a, was there a most memorable experience or, I mean, you just sort of shared one, but memorable character, something humorous from your time in the military that you would like to share? Well, it wasn't actually, a, uh, uh, while I was in the military, I married a, a girl in, in Central America and her father was Chinese. And uh, we were sitting, everybody was away someplace, and we were sitting having coffee, and, and he asked me, he says, what's the matter with your government? And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, why would you choose Vietnam to go to war with? And I says, I don't know, they had, uh, uh, they made us mad or something. And he said, don't you know that you don't fight Orientals. There are just too many of them. That woke me up. I mean, I had never even considered that. You never fight an Oriental. This, if, you, if, you, if you beat him, he's got grandsons and uncles and he's got a thousand other people that will come after you. You don't fight them. You compete with them, that's all. And that, that was a lesson learned. That, well, that's, that's an important lesson. Mm. Uh, we're kind of winding down here, but okay. I guess uh, any, any, uh, anything else, anything we haven't asked or anything, uh, you know, that you would well, like to share? Well, there was one incident with uh, Russian um, merchants and Chinese merchants, and they came in and out of Haiphong all the time. Haiphong uh, in North, North Vietnam North uh, Harbor. They were untouchable. We couldn't shoot at them. We, <coughs> could, we couldn't communicate. We didn't do anything with them. We watched them go in and deliver their munitions and stuff and come out, and, and they'd wave at us and give us the finger and you know, whatever they wanted to do. Hmm. One, at this one time, I, this guy had to be a cowboy. He had to be a, a former military guy. And we communicated him with, uh, with lights, and we told him, leave the area. This is a military zone, meaning Yankee Station. <clears throat> and we were ordered to do this. And he said, okay, we'll do. He turned into us, and he was maybe 100, 150 yards off our our, our starboard or port side and he was turning into us too close but what we didn't realize that we were jackrabbits in comparison to him he was a he was a bulldozer we were a, a Ferrari and, and we scooted out of there pretty quick but that scared the hell out of us 
I mean, if he had rammed us, it would have been an international incident. What kind of a ship? What? It was a cargo ship. A cargo ship? Yeah. So was he trying to ram you? He was trying to scare us. He did a pretty good job of it. Did so. a <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you've had some, uh, your military experiences and other experiences are, are really illuminating, and uh, we just want to thank you for sharing those with us. Well, it was a pleasure. And uh, I'm glad it's over. Not this, but the military service. But that.